Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. OK, cool. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present here. Uh, I'm Lillian Guo. I'm a PhD student at UCL. And today I'll be talking about the work that I'm doing with Louisa Lucy Smith, Serena Paris, and Andrew Ponson on using interpretable deep learning to understand what dictates the halo mass function, which gives the abundance of dark matter halos as a function of their mass. So the halo mass function is very sensitive to cosmological parameters, especially at the high mass end. And to tightly constrain cosmological parameters using data from forthcoming surveys like Rubin or Euclid requires us to be able to model the halo mass function to a percent accuracy or even better. So how do we model the halo mass function? Well, using a theoretical understanding, it should be a pretty simple model where all of this cosmological uh, dependence is just captured by this, uh, by this sigma here that is giving the variance of the linear overdensities in spheres that will collapse to form a halo of mass m. And then when written in terms of this mass variance sigma, the halo mass function becomes universal because the mapping from sigma to n of m becomes uh, essentially independent of cosmology. And then you just need to find an accurate mapping between the sigma and n of m to, and because the mass function is universal, it should generalize to other cosmologies with the same accuracy. So mathematically, we can write the mass function this way, where this f of sigma term on the right is basically capturing all of the information about the shape of the halo mass function. And then there's a term in the front that is just mapping this, oh, sorry, that is just mapping this uh, from a function of sigma to a function of halo mass. So the right top plot there is showing this f of sigma from simulations that were ran with different cosmological parameters and at different redshifts. And if the halo mass function were universal, then we expect all the cosmological dependence to be captured by the sigma here. So then the shape of the f of sigma should be the same regardless of cosmology. So all of these different color lines should lie on top of each other, and there should be no residuals. But the simulations show that this is not the case. And there's been many efforts made to try and understand what is the cause for this non-universality that is impacting the halo mass function above a percent level, but we still don't really have a good understanding. So without universality, well, we can model the cosmology dependence of the mass function using emulators, which basically interpolate between the halo mass functions from simulations that are ran on a grid of cosmological parameters. So this plot on the left here is showing the emulator's halo mass function emulator, it was trained on a 7D WCDM cosmological parameter space. And here it's tested against the additional simulations uh, ran with different cosmological, simulation, uh, cosmological parameters at different redshifts. So we see here that um, within the parameter space that the emulator is trained on, it reaches the percent level accuracy that is required. But the disadvantage of emulators is that it doesn't reliably generalize outside the parameter space that it's trained on. And it doesn't give us an understanding of what is determining this cosmological dependence of the halo mass function. But if we have that physical understanding, then we can build a more generalizable model that is still accurate to the level that we require. And to do that, we really need to understand, well, what are the physical factors that we need to model the halo mass function? And what is missing from the universal picture that we had before? So a leading candidate from literature is uh, the information from the growth function. So this plot on the left is showing again this f of sigma. <coughs> so it's a halo mass function uh, for simulations that were ran with the same power spectrum but different growth histories that are given in the different colors. So the residuals plot on the bottom is showing that the halo mass function is non-universal depending on the growth history. So we want to figure out, well, what do we need to model the halo mass function? And is the information from the growth function indeed relevant? And to do that, we use a deep learning model, the interpretable variational encoder, which Louisa and Jens have told us about. It was used to, uh, previously to successfully find independent and physically relevant factors that govern the dark matter density profile. And so here, we are applying it for our problem. And the key feature in this model that enables knowledge extraction is this low dimensional latent space in the middle. So it contains all of the information 
that is needed from the inputs to accurately predict the halo mass function given the halo mass. And it is low dimensional. In fact, for our case, we find to predict the mass function at rest of zero, we only need three latent variables. And it is disentangled, meaning that each of the three latent variables are learning independent information about the halo mass function. So this then enables us to interpret what each of the latent variables has learned about the mass function and to relate that to the physics of halo formation. So using this model, we want to first figure out, well, do we need the growth function to predict the halo mass function? And to our surprise, we find actually to predict the halo mass function at rest of zero, we just need the power spectrum. And providing the model additionally with the growth function does not actually improve the prediction accuracy. So this may seem at first to uh, contradict existing literature, but what the literature has shown is that growth is adding information to the sigma but sigma does not capture all of the information in the power spectrum. So it could be that our model is still learning growth-related information, but it's just doing that from the power spectrum. But to understand this better, we really need to be able to interpret, well, what information do our latent variables capture about the mass function? And to do that, we use mutual information, which we have heard quite a few times in the conference already. So it's a met metric for the nonlinear correlation between variables that is well-established in information theory. So using mutual information, we can look at for our first latent variable, what information is it learning about the ground truth halo mass function? And if you remember from the earlier slides, we can write the halo mass function this way, where this f of sigma on the right is capturing all the inform important information about the shape of the halo mass function. And then there's a term here that is just mapping this from a function of sigma to a function of halo mass. So the bottom plot here is showing the mutual information between the first latent and these different components. And what it's showing here, so the, so the y-axis is uh, giving the mutual information, and the higher it is, the more information, oops, sorry. The, the higher it is, the more information that the latent has on the component. And what it's showing us is that this latent that is mostly learning about the, the high mass tail of the halo mass function, and what it's doing is it's mainly learning about this f of sigma part and very little, learning very little information about this mapping term. And we find actually the cosmological dependence of this first latent variable is well approximated by this parameter combination here that is roughly the square root of omega times sigma eight. And we know that cluster abundance is sensitive to roughly this parameter combination. So it's quite reassuring to us that a model is finding sensible and relevant quantities. And in fact, we find uh, we're able to predict this parameter combination from the formation history of the halos and their mass fluctuation variance. So this power of 0.46 on the omega is related to the omega matter at a higher redshift when these halos with a mass of 10 to the 14.6 solar masses form. So moving on to our second latent variable, we find that unlike our first latent variable, it's learning very little information about this f of sigma part. Instead, its main function is to learn this mapping from the f of sigma to, the halo, uh, to a function of the halo mass. But, okay, so what about non-universality? Remember we said, said we want to find out what is determining this additional cosmology dependence in the halo mass function that is not captured by universal function like the Tinker halo mass function. <coughs> and so to do that, we look at the third column here, where this pink curve, these pink curves are showing the information that each latent variable has on the non-universality. So it is the information that each latent variable captured beyond a universal Tinker mass function that's shown here in blue. So we find actually, while our first latent variable is learning mostly just the universal part of the halo mass function, our second latent variable, in addition to mostly, mainly learning this mapping from f of sigma to n of m, is also additionally learning about non-universality that is affecting the high mass halos. And then for our third latent variable, it looks like, it may look like it's learning little information about the ground truth halo mass function, but actually we find we need it to be able to achieve the high subsequent accuracy of our model. model. And in fact, we find that this latent is the latent that is learning the most information about the non-universality and the halo mass function, and is mostly doing this 
for lower mass halos. And we're working on pinning down the cosmological parameter dependence and also obtaining a physical interpretation for what is causing this non-universality. Okay, thank you. And so just to summarize, um, we're using deep learning to try and understand what is causing the non-universality and the halo mass function. And this is enabled through a, using a model that learns a compact and disentangled latent representation of all the information that you need to predict the halo mass function. And then we are interpreting these latent variables using the mutual information. So this low dimensional latent space we found can also have other uses, for example, uh, instead of designing emulators to cover the full seven dimensional cosmological parameter space, you can design it to cover this low 3D dimensional space so that we can uh, train accurate emulators using a fewer number of simulations. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the very nice talk. Do we have questions in the room? The next speaker should also set up. Um, if not, do we have a question on Slack? No. Do we have a question in New York? Else is asking a question, and it was a great talk. So I, I just really appreciate somebody using machine learning to try to do human learning. So that was that was just fantastic to actually try and unpack the physics using the machine learning. So I. I, I genuinely enjoyed that talk, and I just thought somebody, somebody should say so. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the comment. I think we have a question. Uh, 